everyone. Uh, so my name is Lalao Yalayo. I am a design and product strategist, currently independent. Um, and uh, when thinking about the subject of empathy and design, what I thought would be useful, because it's always interesting to hear these things from people's experiences, so maybe talk about uh, five things I've learned over my sort of odd 14, 15 years working in digital about how to build and maintain empathy in your design. Um, so as I said, I, I kind of have a, a design and product strategy background, but I started out as a, did an engineering degree, um, and uh, worked for a while as a researcher, a consultant, and then as a designer. I've been in-house with kind of big clients. I've been agency side, uh, selling UX work to other people. So the perspectives are kind of gauged across that wealth of experience, and what I've learned is uh, the better way to do things. Um, so my first uh, way is to actually hire a dedicated user researcher. It seems like a really simple thing to say, um, but I, you know, I came up in UX in a time when the, the industry wasn't very diverse, so we didn't have this many people coming to our events. I used to run a UX event. Um, we had a lot of generalism. People were kind of, uh, you know, kind of like a 1995 web developer where you had that one guy who did the design, the copywriting, the coding, the everything, the maintenance, uh, your hosting provider or whatever. UX has been in the past that way. And so you had people who kind of did this. Um, and so you said, you know, this guy can do the research and he can sketch the interface and the visual design and the prototype, etc., 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 and snake oil. Um, unfortunately, in the modern context, what you increasingly find is that um, we need dedicated specialists to do certain things and research is one of them. It is way too complex to start thinking that as an amazing digital designer who knows exactly how to build for the mobile form factor and for a, a, a smart watch and for a smart TV, that you suddenly know all the appropriate psychological methods about how to interrogate someone's actual needs. Um, I certainly wouldn't walk into a doctor's office and say after spending two weeks watching them I could start treating patients. Um, so it's really important to actually have somebody who's going to help guide that insight approach because if you're going to have genuine empathy and not just kind of create an echo chamber of what I like to hear and what people think about me, 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 you need somebody who's going to help you identify the right methods. And that leads me to my second point which is pick the right research methods. Now I said earlier that I had actually worked in research for a while and um, one of my big bugbears is that uh, you know people see research techniques as uh, user testing. I hate that phrase. You don't test users. You test your product with users. Uh, research is more than just usability testing. Uh, there are lots of different techniques out there that you can actually apply to understand what would someone genuinely do. You know, that phrase that people can tell you they do one thing and then when you're not looking, do the exact opposite is very much true. So you're always looking for not just what people say, but what they actually do. Um, and if we think about how different research techniques uh, come to the table, you've got, you know, there are lots of ways I could have split this. I could have put formative and summative and qualitative and quantitative. And if you don't know what that means, that's why you need a researcher in your team. But these techniques, they give you different things. And the problem is no one technique is a holy grail of empathy. No one technique is going to tell you everything that somebody's going to do or why they did it and how they did it and when they did it and if they would do it again. Um, and what's really dangerous about being overly reliant on one method over another is that our brain wants to take the easy way out at any one point in time. So as designers, if we're absorbing insight that's not necessarily using the right methods or it's not being planned appropriately or it's kind of got false indicators in there, we'll kind of make it tell us the story that we like. And, you know, there are really good articles, this one by Elaine Wery uh, in the US about... UX research pitfalls, if you show someone a chart and there are two lines pointing in the same direction, guess what? They're going to think those two lines are related to each other. That's not necessarily the truth. Um, if you say to somebody, we did the user test and everybody said they really liked this product, but you didn't quite say that you said, hey, what do you think about my product? And you didn't compare it to anything else and you didn't ask them who they were or why people are going to infer that you somehow are telling the truth just because you said so. So it's really dangerous. And the bottom line is, again, it's all about language for me, but what you're looking for are indicators. 
So when you're talking about empathy, you want to know, does someone do something that indicates they might do something else that I can rely on? You want to rely less on inferences. I don't want to guess that because you did this, you might do that. I want to have confidence that I have seen indicators that will tell me that you would do that. Secondly, you're looking for causation, not correlation. Um, every time someone stepped into a room, the air conditioning came on. Are those two things the same? Did one cause the other, or is it just a thing that happened to be happening at the same time as the other? And you need to be really careful not to mistake one for the other, because when it comes to spending X amount of pounds on actually building out a new initiative, you want to feel relatively certain that you're doing the thing that is going to make a difference. And lots of people have been in scenarios where false indicators have led them down one design path, and then you've ended up realizing that this product was never going to make it in the market. And I'll talk about that a little bit later on. Sorry, I'm talking really quickly because I have a cold and I'm kind of talking fast so I can take a breath. Um, number three, do not outsource contact with your users. Um, how many people here are part of an in-house team if you kind of work in InDesign at the moment? And keep your hand up if you currently hire somebody else not in your business to do the user research. Oh, that's good. That's actually changed from the last time I did this. Um, what I have seen a lot of is that companies like to outsource the bits that don't feel like they're part of their sweet spot, so, um, which makes a lot of common sense. Um, contact with users is usually one thing that, that comes high on that agenda. Let's go hire an agency to do a big survey with 5,000 people so we can see what people think. Uh, let's hire an agency that gives us real-time access to NPS scores. Uh, let's get someone else to tell us what the sentiment analysis might be on all the comments in our reviews, etc., etc., etc. That's fine, except when it means that you have somebody between you and that insight, when you no longer have a genuine way to connect with what that information is telling you. Um, and to illustrate this point, I took a liberty with copyright, I'm really, really sorry, um, to build a Dilbert cartoon that illustrates a scenario uh, with an old client of mine that they were stuck in for about 10 years with their insight. I'm not going to read it out, I'll let you guys do it yourselves. But. This is Dilbert and this is Wally. Wally wasn't joking. So in this scenario, we had a, a client who basically outsourced uh, a huge database. They are big, big client. Their digital footprint is huge. Their physical footprint is huge in the UK. And what they used to do was to ask this company to capture every review, all the comments, all the feedback. Um, they would also have all of their analytics, all their stats on every single product that was going on. This company was supposed to keep it all in a database and tell them, hey, you should pay attention to X or Y. The problem was the main company got out of the habit of asking good questions and the other company got into the habit of counting their profits. And so they gradually made it more efficient to collect information and less efficient to actually analyze that information and understand what it was telling you. So if you asked a very simple question like, give me key insights from the last week's worth of mobile behavior, you had a guy who was like, yeah, I'll go get that for you in six weeks. That's just not good enough, that's not okay. And that keeps you distant from the users that you're trying to be empathetic with. Uh, number four is to take out your own biases, and this is actually a really hard one, um, because as an individual, as digital natives, I think we're all kind of always on the cusp of assuming everyone else will do what we would do, and everyone else is going to apply the same logic to how we apply logic to technology. And so research is a good way to just make sure that you step back from that. But we're always running two risks. One is that we other everybody else, so my users are not me, therefore I'm going to sit here like David Attenborough and observe what they do. Wow, they press the home button. That's amazing. It's not amazing, it's just a normal thing. The other thing is to assume that what you would do is what everyone would do, or why somebody did something that you saw is the same reason you would or would not do that thing. And it's a phenomenon called, uh, that a good friend of mine, Andrew Harder, called cultural errors. Now, Andrew spent a long time working for Nokia and eBay doing international research across a number of different cultures, and he identified these researcher failings where you would essentially create bias within your insight because you had brought the wrong assumption to the table. So 
things like assuming cultures are frozen at a point in time. So uh, whatever your views were about um, uh, a particular, I think what was the example he used? Uh, Bollywood films, you know, they kind of uh, doing research with people in India, kind of if you've seen a Bollywood film at, at one point, then maybe that's what you assume the entire country was like, with everybody singing and dancing. Or that they need basic products. So in doing research with people who live below the poverty line, uh, that because everybody was on a dollar a day, they never wanted to spend any money on anything other than the absolute basic functionality. That usability is universally important, which it isn't. Sometimes identity and uh, things like the power distance ratio, again, another psychological term about how different cultures have a different uh, interpretation of um, kind of who's in charge and the deference that they give to that. Some, some cultures defer to the digital product because it's part of their culture to do that. That changes the nature of the usability work that you would do. Um, or that people are rational. Uh, I don't have a job. I get a little bit of money every once in a while. I'm going to save all of that money and only spend it on important things. No, I'm going to go buy a new pair of trainers. It's not necessarily rational what people do. And so what he talks about is a fallacy that if you are doing your research with these cultural errors as a part of your mindset or that of the people who are participating in it, you're actually going to put your own biases into the research. And a really great example of this, um, he wasn't responsible for it, but was Nokia's $25 feature phone that they launched with a lot of fanfare in India about 10 years ago, uh, only to find that nobody would buy it. Because why would you want a $25 phone that proves that you don't have any money, when actually everybody wants a smartphone, everybody wanted the latest phone, and people were willing to save their money and put things aside to go and get the better product. So the aspiration was way more important than your assumption about how people living on less money would spend that money. Cultural errors are a really key part of making sure that your biases are kept in check. And the final point is to keep your insights up to date. Um, it's really, you know, I've seen a lot of clients kind of get into the habit of saying it's really expensive to keep doing ethnography and I can't afford to keep doing this round of research again and again or it takes too long. Unfortunately, you can't really get out of that habit of <coughs> continually checking that people are still doing what they have been doing because the landscape shifts so quickly beneath you. Um, so many people are launching new products, they're starting to change the way people expect things from you. So whether you think that you're competing with Google, Amazon, Apple or not, every time these guys shift the landscape of what people are doing on mobile or what they're expecting to do with voice recognition, that changes your customer's expectation of what you need to deliver in your product and that's just the reality of the game. Um, and to illustrate this one, I'll talk again about uh, a client I had uh, a few years ago and working together with Andrew, actually, you know, we worked together a lot. This is pre-Google Sprint. Um, we tried to come up with an insight to innovation process that would allow us to say, what are we seeing? What is it telling us? And how can we very quickly turn that into a solution? And we called it the Field Studio. Uh, and it was five of the longest days you can imagine, but very, very rich in terms of doing ethno, spending time in a physical location and trying to build a picture of what people were doing, particularly around mobile messaging at the time. Um, and we used to bring a lot of people with us, so um, Andrew is very fond of saying, it's very weird to have two people coming into a person's house to do research, so it's almost no weirder if there were four or five people. As long as they've got space, you can make it a bit more of a social event. So therefore, we bring the tech people along, the product people, the marketing. Everybody gets an opportunity to get first-hand insight from uh, the users. Now, the first time we did this, we went to Mexico in November 20, 000, 2000, 20, 000, 2013. And again, I said it was, we were looking at mobile messaging. The client at the time had a ridiculous monopoly that meant that they were the messaging application that was forced on everyone's phone. Uh, in Mexico and LATAM. And so we went to look at well, what is the actual value proposition that we could bring to the table. And we saw that everybody wanted group chat. Now this is only four years ago, but actually what people were doing was hacking group chat because WhatsApp and other messaging services were not specifically designed for group chat. They were designed for one-to-one, -one. but people were increasingly using group chat as the way of talking to many people at once. So we were like, hey, this is the area that you guys need to focus on. There are lots of features missing. Uh, you know, there are people who have friends overseas and wake up every morning to 60 messages, not summarized. They can't see what the information is aimed at them, no tagging, etc. 
What we didn't know was that three months later, Facebook was going to buy WhatsApp and start shifting the landscape. That should have been the first sign to say that this information that we were seeing was really, really current, but we had to move on it really quickly. We did another field studio in Brazil in February 2014, and then another one in the US in 2015. And we kept seeing the same thing. There was still this need about group chat. We also saw that people were actually not hate, people hated ads, but they didn't hate ads if they were good and they were funny and they made them laugh and it was kind of okay and it was photographic. Um, but nobody was actually servicing that. Now, this particular client felt that because we'd done so many rounds of this and it was so rich and there was so much information, let's stop for a while while we go away and build this thing and then we'll come back and everything will be okay. Except in that year, everybody launched all of the features we'd identified across their different platforms. And so you had Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, eating their lunch on a daily basis. First time we went to Mexico, nobody was really using WhatsApp that we uh, spoke to. By the time we came back to Mexico, I think in uh, late 2015, it was almost completely universal that everybody was on WhatsApp because why the hell wouldn't you be? So the problem they had is that they allowed their insight to get stale and they thought they could go away and take their time and come back to it. But by the time the landscape shifted, what they actually released was no longer fit for purpose. So you've got to be really careful to make sure that you don't put yourself in a position where you assume your empathy is always going to be applicable at a point in time in the future when you get round to it. So those are my five tips. Um, uh, hire a dedicated user researcher. You will never lose money on having someone who is a dedicated specialist who can help you figure out the right way to interrogate. Be clear on the questions you need answers to so you can actually put methods together in really interesting ways. Usability tests are not the only method that you want to use. Don't outsource your, co your contact with users. You really can't buy empathy from a tool, no matter how nice the graphics and the interface are. Um, take out your stereotypes. Make sure that you're not imposing these on other people's reality. And if your empathy is going to get stale, then you might as well not have had any in the first place. So don't bother. Thank you very much.